We dive into a full game preview of the Baltimore Ravens week 17 divisional match with the Pittsburgh Steelers talking Lamar Jackson, Tyler Huntley, Kenny Pickett, and so much more coming up next year on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens Wire. We're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, as always, your team every day. Thank you so much for stopping by today, tuning in, and making us your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms, including over on YouTube. So if you'd like to listen to us in audio form, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, we have it covered video form. On YouTube, we just hit 3,000 subscribers, so if you want to be on that road to 4K, hit the subscribe button. Also, be sure to like the video. On today's episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is discovered this is with more props, odds, and lies than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And here with me today, four of all Ravens wide receivers, Super Bowl champion Kadri Ismail. And you know, it feels like we did this a couple weeks ago. Ravens Steelers back at it again, this time in Baltimore. Baltimore picked up that 16-14 to win on the back of their ground game. It feels like that's something I have to do again here in week 17. Well, it just seems that, you know, if this is the year to say we're going to emphasize the run and latter part of the year, you're going to get into the playoffs via the run, so be it. Um, I think this is uh, this is what you're going to hang your hat on. And I'm, I'm not disappointed by no stretch of the imagination. Late in the year, you do want to run the ball effectively, but uh, it seems as though that um, – if there was a strength of this team and the strength is what you pray the other team doesn't take away because you don't have a plan B, well, running the football is what it is. They've been doing it successfully. They did it successfully at uh, Akusher or Akusher, however you pronounce it, Heinz Field. (laughs) But I think this is uh, one where they're going to have to replicate that if they expect to get a win against uh, their division foe, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right, and in, in that week, uh, what was it, week 14 game, yeah, week 14, the Ravens ran the ball 42 times, averaged 5.1 yards per carry, and they that was led by Gus Edwards. You had J.K. Dobbins, Tyler Huntley, just 12 passes, Anthony Brown, 5, so 17 total passes. Compared to 42 runs, that's obviously the game plan you want right now for the Ravens, especially if you have no Lamar Jackson, and here we are recording on Friday. Wednesday and Thursday, Lamar was not at practice. It seems like we're gearing up for another Tyler Huntley start. In this one, Q, in your estimation, what do you feel like going on with Lamar right now in that injury? We've heard multiple reports about everything. We had the report from Adam Schefter. He might be back by Christmas Eve. Obviously, we're past that right now. Do you feel like Lamar, if it's not going to be this week, which is looking like it's not, do you feel like he'll be back in week 18 against Cincinnati or even for the playoffs here? Well, I think from the pure football standpoint, um, I think he could potentially be back for the Cincinnati game. Um, I think from the bigger picture of it all, contract wise, he could prolong the injury because I really don't want to jeopardize my future and the future dollars that I could potentially earn here or elsewhere. Uh, From a competitive standpoint, we've heard Lamar Jackson talk about all he wants to do is win a Super Bowl. And I think the way in which he went into the season without holding out, and the way in which he, you know, came out and played with such vigor and fervor as far as the competitive nature of it, I don't see him necessarily holding out, but there's 250 million reasons why he has a right to hold out. And I think at the same time, when it comes down to it, when you look at the bigger picture, just pure football wise, my concern is, is that you have that chemistry or lack of chemistry that you, you know, didn't have that you do want to develop with, you know, said running game. And that's, you know, the Gus Edwards of the world, obviously J.K. Dobbins, uh, the way in which your mesh points, the way in which you do your, your RPOs, uh, all of that, you know, your, your quarterback reads, you know, the, the, the groove in which you need to get back as far as the passing attack and as far as the red zone, whether or not we know what Greg Roman is going to do or not do. And 
I don't know. But that being said, you need him out there, at least on a practice field. And for him not to practice, you know, it, it it's saying something. So, uh, boy, I, I, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot that goes into this injury. But first and foremost, when it comes to the injury, it, it clearly is more than just the grade one uh, PCL sprain that, you know, we were led to believe. This is looking more like a grade two, high grade two uh, PCL type of a deal. Right. And I think for Lamar, he is one of the most competitive football players out there right now. He wants to win, not for himself, but but he wants to win for his team. We've seen how big of a team player he is over the course of his career. How he wants to go out there, win for his teammates. So th- there is a lot that goes into it. I know there's been a, lo- a lot of national media narratives saying, well, should he should he just shut it down for himself? I, I don't think it's in his competitive spirit to even do something like that. I know that there's so much that, that he can say and he can do about, well, you know, contract this, contract that. But I think for Lamar, I personally think he wants to get back out there as quickly as he can. He's trying to get back out there because he knows that he has a team that believes in him. He believes in his team. And so I think for Lamar, he he's working. I think he's working because we know how hard of a worker he is. And we've seen that over the course of his career, how he wants to get better, how he has improved. And even when he's dealt with a couple injuries over the course of his career, He's worked and he's worked and he's worked. So I think for Lamar, you have a situation where I think it's definitely possible he'll be back for week 18 against Cincinnati. That's a huge game in multiple different aspects. You know, there's only one or two scenarios where it doesn't really mean anything for the Ravens in terms of the AFC North, but it will mean something in terms of seeding based off of conference records. So for Lamar, I'm confident in him and I'm confident that he's trying to get back right now because that's just, I think, the person and, and, and the player that he is. But Q, when talking about Tyler Huntley, we've seen him beat Pittsburgh once before, obviously with some assists from the run game and even Anthony Brown in there as well. Do you think he can do it again this time in Baltimore? Ooh, uh, I think he, he can, you know, even if you look back at the game in um, Pittsburgh, he, he wasn't in a perfect groove, but it was a game in which you could see before the, the concussion, like, you know, it, he started, you know, kind of shaking off the rust and kind of finding himself. And then I thought, you know, the Atlanta game, you know, you fast forward to that game. I thought that he played uh, a game in which, you know, he, he felt more and more confident and comfortable. And, and the prime example is a Sammy Watkins play uh, where you know, he kept his eyes up down the field and just felt the pressure, got outside the pocket and was able to deliver the ball on a scramble. And then, of course, when you look at what he did with Mark Andrews, that was a dime of a throw. Great route by Mark getting by with a speed release, stacking up on top of the guy. And then once he stacked up on top of him before big man, he, he left him. And that was a great throw. So you're going to have to have those type of efforts in the passing attack. But then I also felt like, you know, he played really smart, complimentary football, didn't really take any unnecessary shots um, and, and just understood the moment. You know, it did, didn't do anything that was too foolish. You could see where, you know, from a fan perspective, oh, you should have took that chance, especially down in the red zone. There was a couple of times, you know, where I thought um, one in particular where Isaiah likely was coming open and he held on to the ball. But it was like, hey, I ain't messing around. I'm just going to go ahead and do what I got to do because I kicked this field goal, or if we kick this field goal, it's going to help us out, let our defense go ahead and do what we do. Um, But then at the same time, you know, from a a two-point conversion standpoint, look strong again. So it's that type of effort I think is going to be needed um, to be replicated if they expect to to sweep uh, this Steelers ball club. Yeah, and I think for him playing to his strengths, if he does get the start on Sunday night where, you know, if he can hit on one or two deep shots, you know, we saw him hit a 40-yarder to Sammy Watkins where he placed the ball in there. If maybe he can connect with Deshaun Jackson playing his game, but I do think he was going to come down to the run game for Baltimore. I did mention that they ran this ball 42 times, averaged 5.1 yards per attempt against this Pittsburgh run defense, which they are no slouch in stopping the run. They're the fifth best rush defense right now. And it's crazy because, again, it felt like, Everyone knew what was coming. Everyone knew the Ravens were running the ball and the Steelers over and over and over again could not stop it. So Q, how do they replicate that success on the ground here in week 17? Again, you have your offensive line pride, their D line pride. Well, something's got to give. And I think for Cam Hayward, he's probably like, yo, 
you whooped my butt. Um, Tyler Linderbaum and company whooped up on them. He got some, but for the most part, whooped up on them. Um, TJ, normally he's coming off the edge and he's like, you know, playing gangbusters. He, he was for for a large degree, but uh, when it came down to it, whooped up on them. That, to me, when you turn on the tape, there's going to be like, oh, snap. Y'all ain't going to do that twice. Watch us. Watch how we come after you. And there's going to have to be that uh, we want it more than you mentality up front. If we have that more than you have mentality, the Ravens will go ahead and win again. If it's, psst, we're just going to take it easy. Man, we got these dudes. We, we already did it. And the Steelers come in with the, okay, y'all, y'all did that. Watch this. Watch what we'll do. And they have that edge to them. That edge is so critical late in the year. Then I, I just don't see this team winning. Um, I, I really think they have to have that, that razor edge sharpness to be able to handle this Steelers ball club. Their receivers on the outside, they're explosive. We saw what they did to Marlon Humphrey. If Marlon is expecting, um, well, okay, he, he, he kind of did his thing against um, the, the young man is um, from from uh, the Falcons, uh, the young rookie. Drake London. Thank you. London, uh, Drake was good and, and made some plays. I think these other dudes, they're going to be trying to make those same plays. Plus, they already got film on him. If he comes with the same pride that this Steelers D line comes with, then I think we're going to have a ball game. I really do. I think this is like one of those things where on both sides of the ball, there is this, man, I, 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 I got to play better. I got to play better mentality. And it's who blinks first. Ravens defense really just, in my mind, they play that team ball, get after you, tenaciousness. But at the same time, big plays is what ruined it for them. Can they limit the big plays? Uh, it looks as though we're not going to see Marcus Peters anytime soon. When it comes to the offense, as you just asked, can the O-line do what needs to be done because you got to run the ball? Can Mark Andrews, can he make the contested catches because you know all attention is going to be on him? Tomlin said it as much. Tomlin's like, yo, we know who Mark is. Are you kidding me? We know he's our go-to guy that we got to stop. We know this. So I, I love the matchup. I think it's, it's a unique one. It's an interesting one. Uh, one is to, you know, keep a streak alive of not having a losing season. The other one is, well, you're the Steelers and we just don't like you. So let's go ahead and sweep you and end the streak. That's what's at stake. And I think it's like I always say, it's like how sweet it would be for the Ravens to be the one that handed Mike Tomlin his first losing season. But offensive insight from Q there. But I feel like he's ready to talk about defense. We'll head into our first break. When we get back, we'll dive into that Baltimore defense in there. Technically round two against Kenny Pickett. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to dive into on the show. But first, I have a very important message. Did you know that driving high is considered driving under the influence? That's right. Driving under the influence of marijuana is against the law in every state, even in states where marijuana is legal. That means driving high can get you a DUI. And if you think law enforcement officers can't tell when you're driving high, you're wrong. Your friends, your coworkers, even your parents can tell. Everyone can tell. So it makes you think law enforcement officers don't know when you're driving high. Driving under the influence of marijuana can slow your response time and change how you perceive time and speed. So even if you think you're fine to drive when you're high, you're not. Because the bottom line is if you feel different, you drive different. And driving high is driving under the influence. So remember, drive high, get a DUI paid for by the NHTSA. We return our second segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still here with Kadri Ismail and it's kind of a, it's a second time around thing for these Ravens and Steelers in 2022, but the Ravens only saw Kenny Pickett for two drives as he went out with the concussion and it was Mr. Trubisky who ended up leading the Steelers up and down the field a little bit. I think a, a stat that surprised some people is that the Steelers actually had more total yards than Baltimore in that week 14 game 329 compared to 309. But since the Ravens didn't really see Kenny Pickett and Kenny Pickett really didn't see the Ravens. Is this like a brand new slate for both these sides as they look to kind of get the better of one another? Yes and no. Yes in that, yeah, he didn't play four quarters. The no of it all is, 
you ain't played four quarters because we had two of the best linebackers come at your butt and got you. Now, again, <laughs> when it comes to PQ, when it comes to the way in which he and Roquan have been roaming the middle of the field, I mean, is it me or each week, like you just continually just get more and more impressed? Uh, yeah, yeah. What they did to, to um, Ritter, you know, last week um, was just phenomenal. Uh, like he just was non-existent. And I think, you know, Pickett, sure, he's he's a better quarterback. But at the same time, like, they just – they swarm so incredibly well. And that defensive front, like, I'm telling you, they are doing an outstanding job. Matt BK and company at Washington, and goodness gracious, like, Calais wasn't even in there, and they were doing their thing. And it's interesting because um, Algier, he – was breaking some tackles, but you could see where, like, it was like a meaningful thud. Sure, he had talent to get off of it, but then all of a sudden you see three or four more guys, you know, come around him, and it's it's that aggressive mentality that, like, Nigel Harris, like, I think the the spark that started all of this, not that they weren't, you know, balling against the run uh, when Roquan got here, going back to the Saints, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm thinking – you know, for whatever the reason, like they elevated their play when it was Pittsburgh and they hadn't really looked back. You know, um, that to me was really evident. I, I was like, OK, this is this is the real deal. And so with that said, yes. What is it that we're looking at? Pickens and what homeboy did to Martin. That's it. Like we got to figure out like. Like. Round two, okay. Ali Foreman, what's up? Like, who's going to blink? What up? You know, rumble and jumble. You know, if you're going to go ahead, you know, get the rope of dope, let's do it. Uh, I think that's what is going to be at stake. And I think for what we saw last week with Drake and now this week, I think with Pickett, I think, or with Pickens, I think this is going to be uh, really what is – an all pro or pro bowl type player. Uh, they, they accept the challenge and, and game on uh, Marlon is going to have his hands full. Yeah. And I think the, the crazy part about the Falcons, I guess, run strategy, because the Falcons came into the game, both as a really good rush team offensively and defensively, but it felt like they were trying to run outside for a lot of the game where they were running like zones to the outside and, you have two of the fastest sideline to sideline linebackers on that Ravens defense. And when they ran outside, it, it worked to an extent. Like there were plays where they were able to break off runs, you know, Tyler Algeo get getting eight, nine yard gains. But there were others where you're just thinking, why are they trying to run it outside so much? Because you had Roquan Smith coming in and making a play, Patrick Queen coming in and making a play. So I don't think that's, and even like the Ravens run, it's hard to run on them anyway, regardless of where you run it. They're the third best run defense in the league this year. But I'm personally not attacking the outside as much as the Falcons did. So maybe the Steelers will try to run some inside stuff, especially if Clay's Campbell isn't in there. But again, you mentioned Justin Matibike played really well. Travis Jones, I thought, played well in week 16. I thought he played well too. But I think when talking about what the Steelers offense has, Q, the actual stats of it, it's, it's not – great for Pittsburgh this year in terms of offensive efficiency. The 20, actually they're yeah 26 in the NFL right now in passing offense with 5.6 net yards per attempt and 24th in the NFL in yards per attempt on the ground. Which aspect are you trying to take away to make Pittsburgh want to mess on offense and be the Ravens first? Running the ball. <laughs> because, you know, it is a rookie quarterback Still, even though it is, yes, late in the year and all the things, uh, he can be prone to mistakes. Sure, he's not Mitch Trubisky. That's why they got him. And obviously, Mitch is the backup and all the things. Um, but still, he, he, you know, from a run, one-dimensional standpoint, from a, hey, if we can cause him to pause and, and be confused for a hot second, you know, if it's a third and long, uh, if it's a, 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 a second and 12 and – you know, you got to figure things out. Now, all of a sudden, it's third and 14 because you didn't take care, you know, the proper uh, read off of your, you know, blitz or or pressure look. Um, that's going to favor the Ravens. And I think, you know, where 
Roquan and, and, and company are coming from, from the speed in which they play, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable with the fact making them one-dimensional. Take away Nigel Harris. I'm not trying to, you know, let them control the clock. I'm not trying to have them take a shot because you got man to man and because uh, he's been gashing us and so we got to bring another guy up in the box. Nah. How about you just play zone because you're putting so much pressure on them with just your base look? You know, it's going to be hard, but I think that that would be the ideal way to look at um, handling them if, if I'm the Ravens defense. Yeah, and I think the name of the game for the Ravens defense, at least in that Week 14 game, was turnovers. The Ravens forcing Mr. Trubisky to throw three interceptions, and each of those interceptions came in plus territory for the Ravens, where they were able to get the ball back when Pittsburgh was driving, could have maybe put up a field goal or a touchdown, and it, it was a two-point win. So the Ravens or the Steelers left 12 points on the board, in a two point loss and even more than that, because they didn't even get any points. So they left multiple scores on the board in a two point loss. How important is it for Baltimore to maybe get a turnover early, get the ball back to their offense, just continuously force Pittsburgh to second guess themselves on these plays where guys are roaming such as Marcus Williams. So what I guess um, it comes down to Greg Roman's red zone. So if you give him a short field, then that means that J.K. can run it in from the 30-yard out. <laughs> because what it was so interesting this week when he was talking about how he felt. The one thing that I look at is he said, you know, when I'm like that 30-yard line, 42-ish, I could, I, I'm good. It's when I got those longer runs, that's when I kind of can feel it a little bit. And so I think for both him and Gus Edwards, they don't have that long speed per se. However, I'd love for the defense to get a turnover. And then, yeah, you have a big burst run that gets it into the end zone because there is a struggle for whatever the reason in the red zone. And I think that's what Greg Roman has really yet to figure out as much as he kind of, you know, trying to, not necessarily talking circles, but talking confusing ways. And I'm like, okay, what are you talking about, bro? Like, okay. So bottom line is for this team to create a turnover, it would just be more than beneficial for what they're trying to do against this uh, Steelers defense. Right. I, th- I think it's one thing for the defense to generate their turnover. It's another thing for what the offense does with it. If, if they don't do anything with it, don't score points or, you know, field goals help but you want to punch the ball in. And obviously Baltimore's red zone offense has not been good this year, especially recently 46.3% conversion percentage touchdown wise in the red zone. That is 30th in the NFL this year. Last three weeks, you dropped that down to 22.22%. That is by far the worst mark. And I think by like eight percentage points, by far the worst mark in the NFL. So that is going to be key for them. But coming up here in our final game, we'll be diving a bit into that Atlanta game, talking a little recap of that, talking about how important the Steelers game is and final predictions for week 17. So be sure to stay tuned. So a ton to dive into on Lockdown Ravens. But first, this episode is brought to you by Bet Online. And BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get all the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to even basketball. They've got it all over at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can even find those over at BetOnline as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head over to the website and let your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. We are back, rounding out Locked On Ravens with Kadri Ismail. I am Kevin Ostriker. And Q, I've kind of been pondering this throughout the week, and I asked you know multiple people about it, Spencer Schultz on our Wednesday episode to be one of them. But that Atlanta game in Week 16, 17-9 victory for the Ravens, we kind of talked about it on our preview episode, but was that game how you expected it to go? It was. <laughs> and actually, I almost got the score right spot on. I mean, <laughs> you know, I was 17-7. Uh, but I, I just really thought the defense, you know, like it, it, Atlanta, sure. Um, you know, the young receiver Drake is a talented kid. He's going to make some plays as he continues to mature and grow for years to come, you know, kind of a big body guy, but very smooth in his, his movement flow. Um, I thought their running game, their running backs, like it's weird. To me, it looked like they had more yards, and the stats didn't show it. 
um, because I think what really happened was that they would get a good run, but you had six or seven other defenses like really just clamping them down that kind of nullified the good run. So that was a good thing. Now, with that said, the, the one thing that just it, it kept coming to my mind is, can this defense finish before the half and finish at the four-minute mark? Right before the half, they started struggling a little bit. And then at that four-minute mark, they finally finished and obviously sealed the deal. Uh, Fruit Punch was back, which was awesome to see, you know. Um, Marlon just seems as though when, when you know, he gets it in his mind to play, like he is, whoo, man. And, and, and it's so funny and interesting. Uh, Kyle Hamilton, like, you know, every week I, I kind of like, wow, okay. All right. Yeah. I see you, bro. But then what's crazy is like his arm, um, length, his, his reach, like, uh, it was a, I think it was like a quick screen and he knifes around the blocker and like, you know, reaches out to tackle the defender. And I'm like, God, his arms (laughs) it's just all it's all you know it's like wow so he's this tall rangy defender um now he just needs to use those arms and confident and and i think it was early on on the uh yeah it was early in the first half maybe it was um over on the the uh atlanta Falcons sideline where i just thought my god man as your game matures you're going to be more and more confident you're going to just step in front of a route pick that thing off and it's pick six or at least setting it up real sweet for the offense. Um, his, his, his coming off the edge as far as his blitz pressure, hmm. again, long arms. Um, he, he gets up the field. He's a good strider. He has a good long stride when he gets up the field, try to get after the quarterback. But uh, I really thought the defense played really well. Uh and and when they needed to make that that necessary fourth down stop inside the red zone, like dang, talk about swarming the ball and finishing, that was impressive. Yeah, for for all the Ravens' red zone offensively struggles there, the d- defensively Baltimore's red zone defense has been good at least the last couple of weeks. Where especially Atlanta, zero for four. Atlanta went zero for four in the red zone, which. They held Atlanta to those three field goals, nine total points. But hey, I'm I'm excited for Kyle Hamilton too. He's someone that again, no clue how I thought of 14, but I'm sure the Ravens will take that 10 times out of 10 based off how he's performed and how, even how he's matured over the course of the year. But Q, this is an important game, and I know the Ravens are working hard. Right? Obviously, I, I don't question Lamar Jackson's work ethic. I think he's a very hard worker working to get back from that injury. But the Ravens themselves are working hard also to be able to get ready for this Pittsburgh Steeler team. Based off of everything you've seen, every game that we've seen, is this game, I, th- I think we all agree that Week 18 is probably going to be the most important game of their season. But is this the second most important game coming up? Well, football-wise, it's important because it's the next game. Uh, fan-wise, uh, perception-wise, it's the, mo- the second most important game because you made the playoffs. What do you? What, what, what kind of identity do you have? Like, are you – seasoned and ready for the playoffs or is there still work to be done uh obviously the the elephant room it, it's the red zone and you know as you said earlier ranking 30th ain't it uh other teams are good you know they 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 are in the playoffs because they're hitting their stride and when you hit your stride it's like yo it's not about the playoffs it's about advancing um it's not about being one dimensional it's about we can attack you multiple ways and the best way we attack you, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't defend against it. That's running the ball for the Ravens, and that's what you know we're looking at, whether or not they're going to be that team um, against the Steelers. And the Steelers are a good litmus test. It's going to be a close game, so we're not going to go ahead and do some crazy score prediction. But Tyler Huntley is going to be your quarterback. They flex this game, mother of pearl. Okay, let's see what you got. Yeah, the NFL loves flexing those Ravens game. We, we could even get it again next week when the Ravens face off against Cincinnati if that's a, a battle for the division. So that could be the 820 game. But yeah, I don't I don't think we're getting any 45 to 40 score predictions in this one, Q. How do you see it going? You know, I think it's simple. I think this is a game where it's, it, it's 20 uh 17. 
and and the Ravens win. And I think it's 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 just plain old Steelers, Ravens, classic. And you're walking across the field, giving a hell of a lot of respect to Mike Tomlin and company, breaking their streak, going in the locker room, and then saying, ah. <laughs> I, I, I think that Baltimore, they have an opportunity here to really hit their stride in a couple of areas like you talked about. And I think it's, uh, it's important to do it now before the playoffs start. You want to have some sort of momentum heading in, whether you do win the North, whether you are a wild card team. You want to be able to hit on some of the areas you're struggling. And Baltimore's run game is great. Their defense is playing really well. But can you get your red zone offense figured out? Can you get the play clock stuff figured out more consistently? How can you work the passing game into it? Can you push the ball down the field? I'm saying my my final prediction, I'll say 23-21 Ravens. I'm saying Justin Tucker field goal to win it again. I know we've had a couple of issues with field goals getting blocked over the last couple of weeks, but I think he's money on a game winner. I, I'm taking Justin Tucker 10 times out of 10 for another historic field goal in the historic career of the greatest kicker of all time. Q, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for hopping on with me. And again, hopefully the Ravens will be fighting for that AFC North after coming off of a big, big week 17 win against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And that Cincinnati game will be the new year, 2023, their first game in the new year. Yeah, I'm telling you, it, it's going to be a, a heck of a start to the new year. And hopefully uh, this is the last week we'll talk about all the Lamar Jackson drama and he'll be back and everything will be good. And they'll be going into uh, the final game of the year with some level of momentum so they can kick some butt in the playoffs. Yeah, Lamar's so important to him, so hopefully he's able to get back and and get healthy as soon as possible. But that's all we have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let me get back here on Monday in 2023. We'll be diving into everything that happened in that Ravens and Steelers matchup, so be sure to stay tuned for that, and I will see you back here on Monday.